begin. I welcome you all to today's edition of our teaching devotional, Epignosis Daily or Epignosis Online. And on behalf of me, Pastor Fred Abeka and Lady Patience Abeka and all you amazing, amazing, amazing saints, we say welcome to today's edition of our daily teaching devotional. By way of reminder, we do have our recordings on our YouTube channel, which is FGCI London. Um, and for, if for some reason you've missed quite a bit, what, it doesn't matter whatever topic you are sort of still want to have clear understanding about, you would do well to go to the YouTube channel. And once you go there, you'll be able to get the titles. When you get there, if you're using a tablet or a phone, if you, if you put or hover or put your finger on a particular clip, it will bring the entire title out, including the lesson number. And then you'll be able to know whether it's lesson one or lesson two you want to send or listen to, okay? I also say that if for some reason you have been talking to somebody about them having epignosis, accurate knowledge of the word of God, and for some reason you don't have the time or sometimes um, your articulation, you think it's still not clear, you just come to one of those videos, pick one of them, maybe in sequence, and then send it to the person. Above all, let us also share, somebody somewhere needs clarity in their mind, but they don't know how to, they don't know how to go about it. They, have, they need that clarity in their mind, but they don't really know how to go about it. Yes, so apart from that, I would say that once again, because this is a very technical subject, um, I would also beseech thee by the mercies of God that except you're in a place where like those who are working, they cannot take down um, points, but if you can, even in there, if you can take points and especially those Bible verses that are so critical to the explanation and clarity of the word of God. Apart from that, hey, take your, yourself maybe a cappuccino, <laughs> water, whatever you can. Let us sit down as we travel on this journey of a topic which I shared to Birmingham FGCI um, um, branch. And I thought that it would be fair for all of you to be able to um, have a proper dose of it because of connectivity issues. So I'm really breaking it down. This is something that, that was compressed within um, an entire um, hour of teaching whilst I was there. Um, but I've decided to break it down to you guys. So you guys actually have got the best of the best. Even though I, 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 I taught it within lesser than even an hour, you know, but you guys have got it over three days, which is, I think is fantastic because then you guys will have the real, you know, unearthing of it all. Right, so as usual, I will do a quick recap of what we have done so far. And then after that, we will get into the very integuments of what we want to do. So our topic that we I dealt with that day is actually the significance of the resurrection of Christ. And of course, that's part 26. And the theme or the area that we are focusing on in this resurrection aspect of Jesus is the believer's boundless superiority over Satan. So before we even get into, let me just do a quick recap of that regard, a very, very quick recap of how far we've gone. So, so far, we've found out that there's a Bible verse that many believers read, um, and that Bible verse, um, which is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and, and also another verse that we we'll deal with today in Ephesians chapter 6, has given the impression that we are to war or fight against demons. But we studied so far that that word war or warfare in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 from verse 3 downwards is not English language war. It's not English language war. He's not talking about war in terms of you trying to do something against somebody to gain the upper hand, okay? But we said clearly that this is a different kind of war, but he used war for you to know the intensity of that kind of conflict. And we found out that the war is a war of the mind. It's a war of the mind. And he's saying that Satan, in through that study, that Satan operates through men function from their spirit and their mind, just as Jesus functions through the believer in terms of their spirit and their mind. So this is where the domain is. This is where the domain is. And all activities of this world are directly or indirectly 
linked to that. In fact, if you study history, I did history in sixth form, we found out that the two world wars, if I tell you the reason of the two world wars, first world war, 1914 to 1918, second world war, 1939 to 1945. If I tell you the, the reason that brought the wars, you'll be shocked that over such a silly, flimsy, you know, whimsical thought that the whole world was under the grip of one man or a nation. How? Satan influenced it through the mind of that person. So we said, we established that this is a war of the mind. The only way that Satan can control men is through their minds. The way that the Holy Spirit can gain, as it were, cooperation with man is through the mind. So the mind is the battlefield. Being a believer, being an unbeliever. That is what that word war refers to. Satan hides behind that and operates. Just as the Holy Spirit is in a believer and is able to correlate. Very important that we do understand that. We also said that why is Satan so interested in that mind war? Why? Because the facts of the gospel is what brings liberty, freedom for man. Satan does not want man to be free. Satan always wants to find a way to subjugate man, always. So the facts of his fighting is against the facts of the gospel. Now, I want you to be clear on that today as we go forward. Follow me carefully on this. What has Satan got to do with your decision about buying a Mercedes Benz or buying a house? What has that got to do with him? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's nothing. That is not what he's targeting whether you buy a house, even though he can cause you to make a mistake that will be costly, but the end of it is to take a dig, is to attack your identity in Christ. Because once he knows that if all of us believers know our identity in Christ, then this man has no room to operate. Imagine if the whole world believers, everybody was born again. Can you imagine, are we going to produce machine guns to kill people? Are we going to do, you know, I mean, just think about it across board. Think about it. So Satan's aim is that man will never discover Christ. And in, even in discovering Christ, they will never know of their identity, who they are in Christ. So in 1 Timothy chapter 2, from verse 1, it says that God wills that everyone will come to the saving knowledge of Christ, that all men will be saved and come to the knowledge of Christ. You see, saved, come to the knowledge of Christ. Saved, come to the knowledge of Christ. So saved, salvation, Satan will try and prevent you to get born again. Then when you get born again, he goes to number two, for you to come to the knowledge of Christ. That word knowledge is the Greek word, epignosis, accurate knowledge of Christ. So you can be saved all right, but you can still be wallowing in inaccurate knowledge of Christ. And so long as Satan can get you in one of these places, one, you are not saved, he's happy. Two, even though you are saved, he will make sure you never get the accurate knowledge of Christ so that he can still try and wield some control. So his strategy is deception. What is the deception? Deception against the facts of the knowledge of, of Christ in who you are. And then when he is able to deceive you, the end point we said yesterday was what? Was fear. Was fear. Was fear. Was fear. And how does he operate through fear? Through fear, he can, once your fear comes in, the door is opened. The door is open. So we read some few Bible verses and I'll go over them again um, in terms of Satan's strategies. Once that door is open of fear, then Satan now gains the ascendancy into the mind and hearts of people. So let us go into just a few. Job chapter 3, 25, he said, for the thing which I greatly fear comes upon me and that which I am afraid of befalls me, fear. Then we said in Job 42, he said, he only knew of God you only knew of God by the hearing of the ear. A lot of believers only know God by hearsay. They have never known God through the scriptures and through the epistles. 
Then we said in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, he said, For God has not given us or did not give us a spirit of timidity, of fear, of cowardice, of craving and cringing and fawning in fear, but has given us the spirit and power of love, of calm and well-balanced mind and discipline and self-control. So God's will through the knowledge of his word is that one, he has given the spirit of what? Of power of love. And of a sound mind. So sound mind is the will of God. That in the midst of the cacophony of confusion, you, by the knowledge of who you are in Christ, you are the one that is in control of the situation. Now, the, God never promised the believer a bed of roses. If you're a believer and you think like that, that thinking is in itself deception. For Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation, but in me, you have peace. The peace I give unto you, not as the world, but such as I give. In this world, you will have tribulation. The word tribulation is the Greek word telepsis. Telepsis. It means pressure. 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 Because in this world, there are systems, political systems, economic systems, social systems, and these are the fabric of society that man created. And in this world system, it is about greed. So because of greed, men would devise systems that would try and cheat people and not let others go ahead and they want to get it. So, because this system is based on Satan's nature and greed, you will have pressure. You understand that? So he said, but God has not given us that spirit of fear. So we said that fear, fear, this spirit of fear, we saw it in Hebrews chapter two and we'll come to it again. So God has not given us a spirit of fear. God does not operate through fear at all. Fear is of the devil. And we said that in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, we said the mother of all fear is spiritual death. He said, just as the children are flesh and blood, he, Jesus, partook of the same nature that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death. That is the devil. Verse 15, so that he might free all those who through their entire lifetime were subject to the bondage to the fear of death. Subject to the bondage of the fear of death. Subject to the bondage of the fear of death. So the fear of death, out of that comes so many fears. The first fear of the spirit of death is when a person dies, where are they going to spend eternity? So all that man does outside Christ is to be able to see if they could gain this exemption from this spiritual death and this mortality. So some of them go through fetish. Some of them say they want to be immortal. They drink concoctions. Some of them say, look, you know what? It doesn't matter. Let me enjoy life to the best of the best. If I die, I die. See that all that is because of fear of death. In that fear of death is so many types of fears. Fear of the unknown, fear of failure, fear of what will happen to me tomorrow, fear that I might never, never get married, fear of poverty, fear of sickness, fear of disease, fear of the fact that even though I have prayed, I am still afraid that maybe the promise and the prophecies that God has spoken about me will not come to pass is the greatest fear. So the purpose of Satan's deception is first of all, to bring you in a place of not knowing who you are in Christ, but the ultimate is to inject fear. Once fear sets in, you have opened the door for Satan to have full operation in what he wants to do. So we said that, we said that in those Bible verses that we have done in Job, and then 2 Timothy, and so the Bible says in 1 John, verse number four, there is no fear in love for the born again man. Dread does not exist. Dread, dread, dread does not exist. But full grown, complete, perfect, or mature love 
turns fear out of doors and expels every trace of terror. For fear brings with it the thought of punishment, terror, torment. And so he who is afraid has not reached, has not reached the full maturity of love, is not yet grown into love's perf complete perfection. Now, when he talks about love here, he, he's talking about Jesus is love. God is love. He's talking about Jesus. The entirety of all that Jesus did projects the love of God. So he's talking about what Jesus did, that the person who is walking in fear, do you know that people have got fear of flying, fear of heights, all this, if you trace it and trace it and trace it, is because of the person's identity. They don't have confidence in themselves. And that confidence has been dented because of words spoken or the society you grew up in. So when you come into Christ, Christ through the knowledge of Christ, this word, rebuilds your identity. Your spirit is already solid, but now your mind must get used to who you are. So all phobias, fear, comes out of the fear of spiritual death. But now that you know better that you are not going to spend eternity in hell, but you are in heaven by faith in Christ, that should change everything. But Satan always tries to find a way to discredit those facts. So now today, we've dealt with the second Corinthians chapter 10. We said the war is a war of the mind. The war is a war of the mind. And Satan does that so that he erodes your confidence. Now, from this place on, I want you to pay critical attention. I want you to pay serious attention to this. Do not let anything distract you from here, this point onwards, where I'm going, because I'm going to deal with serious technical issues over an old, long tradition in this Bible verse. So let us go down to the book of Ephesians. And I'm going to go to Ephesians chapter 6. And we're going to deal with that. Ephesians chapter 6. And let us see why is it that we have seen it in another light, other than the way it was written contextually. We are dealing with the contextual application of the word of God. All right. So let us go into Ephesians chapter 6. It's a long verse, but it requires painstaking exegesis. So we've got to be very careful here and take it one step at a time. So once again, I am going to be dead slow. I repeat, do not let anything distract you. Now, before I start Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 to 20, one of the cardinal mistakes that believers do in studying the word is taking Bible verses out of its setting. The Bible was not written in chapters and verses. The Bible was a single compendium. It was one script. So for example, the book of Ephesians was a letter which started with an introduction and had an end and it was sent to the churches. A single letter, a single letter. But later translators in trying to give some semblance of explanation, decided to break it up into chapters. Now, it is this breaking up into chapters that causes the damage. Because in a reader's mind, one who is not properly schooled in the things of the word of God, you think that chapter one, verse one to three, and then they do a subheading, it's talking about something different. Then from the verse five to 10, with another subheading, it's talking about something different. So it changes the narratives and makes you miss out on what exactly the person is saying. So when Apostle Paul, Apostle Peter, Apostle James, Apostle John put pen to whatever they were writing on to send it to the churches, they had one main thing in mind in every book. So the book of Ephesians is addressing one problem like the book of Galatians is dealing with another gospel. The explanation. Ephesians is dealing with our status over and above Satan and his demons. The book of Ephesians is talking about your spirit position, your born again spirit position, 
where your spirit in Christ is now, the way God sees your spirit, the way demons see your spirit, the way Satan sees your spirit, it is only you and I who are not aware of that position. Because some words play on our mind, forgetting that the Bible was not originally written in English language. So we have to look at the context. Even if you don't know Hebrew, you don't know Greek, the context, what is context? What the book is talking about. So what is Ephesians talking about? Ephesians is talking about your superiority, the believer, your superiority over Satan and demons. That is what he's talking about. Not your physical body, your spirit. Of course, your spirit is in your body and your spirit carries your body. So obviously, that is where you are. I want that part to be clear in your mind. So Paul is not writing this with this hint, with a suggestion that we are diminutive, we are lesser. That is not what he's saying about, talking about. Remember, I told you that in the style of all the apostles writing, they will use chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, to talk about spirit salvation. Then chapter four or chapter five, or chapter five or chapter four will be about soul salvation of your will, your intellect, and your mind. So the same thing he's doing here, chapter one of Ephesians, chapter two, chapter three, chapter four, chapter five, he's talking about spirit salvation. What has happened to the born again man's spirit? We get that. Now, before he established that, I want to establish something else before we go into this. So let's go. Ephesians 6.10. In conclusion, be strong in the law. So that is even an alert. He did not say, be strong in yourself. Now, be strong in the Lord is also a kind of figure of speech. For example, I can say that Sister Sherry, be strong in mathematics. It's not talking about physical ability to lift my things, but I'm talking about make sure that you have a thorough understanding of mathematics. So when we say be strong in the Lord, through your union with him, draw your strength from him, that strength which his boundless might provides. He's saying that be thorough in your knowledge of what the might the spirit of God provided where? In the resurrection. Are you knowledgeable? Are you completely thorough? If you are sleeping and I slap your face to wake up and ask, who are you in Christ? Do you have to not think of words? Now, bear in mind that what he's talking about here is not that you are going to do something. No, your spirit is already. But do you know, are you aware? Are you aware what has happened to your spirit? That is what he's talking about. And what is that position of that spirit? Observe. Now, he wants you to know that Satan has no power. Watch it. Let's go on. Let's take a few Bible verses before we continue. I told you that this will be a very slow process. So take your time with me. Let's look at some Bible verses. How to be strong in the Lord. Matthew 28, 18. Jesus approached after resurrection and breaking the silence said to them, all authority, all power of rule in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Then he took the same power based on that and told them in the verse 19, go then. Go then means in this power, this all power. Now, if he has all power, heaven and earth, Heaven and earth, remember, they are figures of speech. All power. He's not talking about political power. That's not what he's talking about. He's dealing with spiritual facts. If you're thinking all, why did he say all? The word there all is passa. All in the context of what I've done. What I've done is linked to something. It's linked to the fact that this power was in somebody's hand already. It was given over legally by Adam to Satan. And that is what Satan had used down the years. Satan operated in Adam's body. And so he has taken that with a plus. So if he has taken all, then 0% is left for Satan. Do you get it? 
Zero percent. All is all. I said, all is all. All is all. Except we don't understand the English language of it. All is all. None is left is to Satan. But Satan in deception to the immature believer and the unbeliever who does not know these facts, Satan will still approach and make it be like he still has something. But outside the facts of the gospel, he will deceive you. Even the ones that have the gospel, he still tries always. So he said, all, all does not leave anything out. I said, all leaves nothing out, which means Satan has none. I told you, Satan is not omnipresent. He cannot be everywhere at the same time. There is only one omnipresent, Jesus, God. Satan can never be omnipotent. There is only one omnipotent, Jesus. Satan can never be omniscient, all-knowing, all-wise. There is only one all-knowing, all-wise, Jesus. He said all. Let's take another one. Luke chapter 10. Look at it again. Look at from verse 18. And he said to them, and this was even before he went to the cross. We are dealing with the believer's boundless might, power, authority, and superiority over Satan in Christ. To the one that is not well trained in the word of God, you will not see it like that. He said to them, I saw Satan falling like lightning flash. <laughs> from heaven, from the heavenly realm. He was talking about the fact that every time that Jesus did something, that was Satan's downfall. Look at that. That was even before he went to the cross. Watch. This was even before he went to the cross. To these 70, behold, I have given you authority and power to trample upon serpents and scorpions. Serpents and scorpions, they are metaphors for demonic powers. He had not even gone to the cross. And physical and mental strength ability over the power that the enemy possesses and nothing shall in any way harm you. That was before he went to the cross. Even then, let's go to Philippians Chapter two from verse five, let this same attitude, I'm establishing that Satan has no power. Let this same attitude and purpose and humble mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Let, let, let him be your example in humility. What does he call humility? Verse six, who although being essentially one with God and in the form of God, possessing the fullness of the attributes which make God, God, did not think this equality with God was a thing to be eagerly grasped or retained, he goes on, but stripped himself of all privileges. He talked about when he became a human being and rightful dignity, so as to assume the guise of a servant in that he became like men and was born a human being, that's God. And after he had appeared in human form, he abased and humbled himself still further and carried his obedience to the extreme of death and even the death of the cross. Therefore, because he stood so low, God has highly exalted him. The word there in the Greek is huparub so, that is <laughs> beyond, 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 beyond. And has freely bestowed on him the name. Now, wait there, wait, wait. Pause, the name. But I thought his name is Jesus Christ. He was Jesus when the angel appeared. He said, for his name shall be called Jesus. The angel appeared to Mary, and he shall save the people from their sins. When he walked the face of the earth in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, his name is Jesus, the Christ. So what does he mean that mean by freely bestowed on him the name, as if there's another name apart from the name of Jesus? No. So that word, the name, there is not the name as my name is Fred. Your name is Esther. Your name is John. That word name means regency or office. Office. 
status, privilege, position. It's not named as in appellation, as named as the name of a thing. No, but he bestowed on him the office, the office, the status that is above every other status. <laughs> that at the name, please watch, watch carefully. Please watch, 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 watch. We have been saying that at the mention of the name, please, I want you to look, please look, look on the screen, look. Is that the word mentioned there? Did you see the word mentioned? Did you see the word mentioned? So he's not talking about this name as my name is Fred, call my name. He's talking about position, status. Mention is not in that verse. He did not say that at the mention of the name of Jesus. We, we, we say it, I used to say it, but I look carefully. It's not at the mention. There's no word mention here. He said that in that, in the name or at the name, in, in status, position, privilege, office. And where are you in that office? <laughs> that means the mere status of Jesus, the mere, the ayabakaya, the mere status of Jesus is superior. He goes on. Every knee should must bow where? In heaven, Uranus, on earth, cosmos, and under the earth, Tartarus. Huh? Huh? All. And every tongue, frankly and openly, confess and acknowledge that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. He said, let this mind, and where are you and I in this? He's talking about, we have been raised to that level. We are there now, above heaven, superior on earth, superior on it. Now, this is not some superior as to, because I'm superior, so I put my nose in the air and I become snobbish. That's not what he's talking about. Remember, he's, not, he's talking to, it's about spiritual realm, spirit position. Demons know this, they recognize us as this. If they recognize Jesus, they recognize us. For example, Jesus in his earthly work, by merely walking towards people that were demon possessed, the demons started to scream even without him saying anything. Superiority. So I submit to you that, watch the next one. I submit to you. This is the office that you and I are in. Let's go to the next one. So he wants your eyes to be open to that by having the eyes of your heart flooded with light so that you can know and understand the hope to which he has called you. He's called us to that office of where Jesus is. And how rich is his glorious inheritance? That inheritance is the spirit in you, the status you, the privilege you, where you stand in Christ. And that so that you know and understand what is the immeasurable, that's case coming again, and unlimited and surpassing greatness of his power in and for us who believe as demonstrated in the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ, when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule, authority, power, dominion, every name that is named, above every title that can be conferred, not only in this age and in this world, but also in the age to come. So based on that, I submit vehemently that the believer in Christ is superior to Satan by a hundred billion light years. And Satan has no power. But it will not be apparent if you don't know these facts. So let's go back to the Ephesians chapter 6 then. And let us continue there. So based on that, that is what Paul meant by in conclusion, be strong in those facts that I just read. Because that's happened to your spirit already. Be strong in those facts. Be thorough in those facts. Be conversant with those facts. Meditate on them consistently so that it becomes more than second nature. Then he comes and tells you. Now, this is where it gets interesting. Verse 11. Put on God's whole armor the armor of a heavy armed soldier, which God supplies. Please take note, put on God's whole armor. The way it was written, it 
it creates the impression that you have to now put it on. But that is not what we see. That is not the import or the meaning of it in the Greek language. It's not saying you to put on. What that word means there is that you have to now act it. He's, no, wait, this armor is talking about, he's not talking about armor of your physical body. The armor is your born again spirit. Your born again spirit is like this. But your mind doesn't know that. The, it's not now you are going to put on. No. Your born again spirit is already cladded. Your born again spirit is already this. But you don't know that. That's why he prayed earlier that the eyes of your understanding will come to this understanding. Your born again spirit is already this, but your mind doesn't know that. So when he says put on, he's saying be conscious that you are heavy armed already. Be conscious. So if you're not conscious, look at what happens. That you may be able successfully to stand against not some, not some, all the strategies uh -huh, and the deceits of the devil. King James calls it the wiles of the devil. What are the wiles of the devil? We studied it on, on Monday. They are imaginations, they are reasonings, they are things that exalt itself against the knowledge of God. The knowledge of God in Christ is what Jesus has done. So that is why there are many believers who are in church, but they are beaten every day, beaten every day. They have no joy. They have no hope. They go to church. They dance all the dance. They do all, but they have no knowledge of what Jesus did. Not one. Not one. They don't know anything about who they are in Christ. And yet, they go to church Sunday in Sunday out. Even those topics are not even taught who they are in Christ. That is why Satan has taken advantage. They don't know that they are royalty. Imagine, imagine a whole Prince Harry or William going to sit in some park and saying, with all the royalty, oh, life is difficult. Life is royalty. Then somebody will tell him, but Prince. You are royalty. I don't feel royalty. I don't feel royalty. Everything is waiting for you in the palace. I don't feel royalty. Look at the problems I'm having. That's exactly how many people do. Because he's not conscious. He's not conscious of who they are. So he said, until you put on the mindset, the put on is your mind. Your spirit is already. The put on is your mind. That's why there's responsibility. Your spirit is already. But you must now take it by the knowledge. So look at the key word there, strategies. That is all Satan has, folks. That is all Satan has. That is all Satan has. Please, let me explain something before I go on. Oh, maybe I have to stretch this to tomorrow. But let me explain this. There's so much in this verse, I cannot rush it. I, I, look, I'm not under any pressure. I'm not going to rush it. What you must know today, I'll let you know today. Because this Bible verse has done damage to the body of Christ. Let me tell you something. Don't confuse functionality with what we call power. Functionality, for example, fish, their functionality is that they are, they are at home in water. A bird is functions in the air because that's the way it's been designed. Don't confuse those things with power. An evil spirit turning into a crocodile, it's not power, it is functionality. They have the ability to do so. They have the ability to do so. But he's using functionality to scare you. I had a, a, a testimony of a man of God who one of his church members said, my family, all of them have died through some disease. And now he has been, he's, he, he fears that he's the next in line, but it's because of a certain shrine in their village. So the man of God said, really? He said, come with me. So this man of God stopped what he did, took a car. They traveled to far, about two or three hours drive to that village. When they got to the village, they said, this is the shrine that is in the house. And everybody is afraid of it. The man of God said, is that it? The man, the man of God told the, the, the brother, said, you stay here. The man of God walked, watched it, walked. That, I, it's just, it's just man-made. He walked to that place where the idol was. What did he do? 
excuse me to say that the man of God said he weed on the idol. There's nothing spiritual about that. He walked backwards. Then, the, then the, the brother said, ah, you did not pray. He said, why should I pray? I wanted to show you that this man, these demons, their known entity, they sat in the car. They came back to, they came back to the capital where they were. That guy brother is still alive today. For them to know that Satan is, is bluffing. He uses those things, change into crocodile, change into that. For you to think, because you don't have enough knowledge of wh where you stand. You think that is something. Hey, he changed into a snake. Hey, crocodile. Hey. So we look at the functionality and he uses that to what? Deceive us. But when it comes to power, the power is in something else. Ability to know where you stand and where you stand from that position and you issue decrees. Did Satan deceive Eve by holding her neck? You see that Satan deceived Eve by words. So I submit to you again here. All that Satan has is this that I've put in this color. Strategies and deceits and the wiles. Why? Because he doesn't want you to discover where God has placed you. That is all he wants to attack. He, so he does it indirectly. The, the purpose of the reason why all those problems you are going through that you think you can't do anything is to take your mind away from your status. So when in that trouble, look at how you are running helter-skelter everywhere. You have forgotten Bible verses. You forgot. So in that, if that problem should last for three weeks, three weeks, you will never look into the Bible. Never. He has got you right where he wants you. He has got. But in God's mercies, God also, pray, but God functions through his word. So let us go on. So please, I want to submit to you, Satan has no power, zero. His function is this, but right, right now you are superior to, that's what Paul is saying. So let's go on now. Look at the same word in 2 Corinthians 2.11. To keep Satan from getting the advantage over us. How does Satan get advantage over you? For we are not ignorant of his wiles and intentions. The same wiles is what we just read in Ephesians, strategies, deceptions. And what is the deception? The deception is in the facts of the word of God. He will distort it. He will not let you get good teaching. He will not let you be represented right or keep you away from it or use problems and situations to make noise to distract you. Problems. And that's why I say that, listen, church should be a place of teaching. I visit, uh, in the past, I used to visit churches and throughout their service, they give almost two hours to entertainment, praise, praise, 45 minutes. Worship, 45 minutes. They say they are bringing their presence down. No prayer even. Testimonies, one hour. And then uh, announcement, 30 minutes. Teaching, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. By the time they get to the teaching, most of the people that dance, they are sleeping because they don't see the importance. So, so long as Satan can lie to you in that area, the, Teaching of the word is not important. He has gotten half of you. Teaching. The apostles, they could teach. Paul could teach for two hours straight nonstop and nobody complained. But today, we are able to watch movies for two hours. We'll never sleep. We can chat with our friends. And I'm, I'm not driving at anybody. I'm just being general. We can chat with our friends on social media. That's right. That's what it's doing. But when it comes to the word of God, we have no interest. And you know what? You might think it doesn't mean anything. Satan doesn't care about that. Once he can get you to another level, you're not interested in the word. You're not interested in prayer. You're not interested in teachings. He's fine. That he's dancing. He's all right. The moment you start to come into the light, he doesn't like it. So now let's come to this keyword, which I might do a bit of it and we shall end. This is where the whole problem starts. Ephesians 10, 6, 12 onwards. For we are not wrestling with flesh and blood, contending only with physical opponents, but against the despotisms, against the powers, against the master spirits who are the world rulers of this present darkness, against the spirit forces of wickedness in the heavenly sphere. I'll, I'll deal with only verse 12 today. I can't do verse 13. Let's deal with verse 12. There's too much in the verse 12. 
the moment we hear the word wrestle, I mean, I almost when I grew up in Christ, that this verse, oh, this verse, this verse that they have done, they have done mess to this verse. They will not even finish quoting. But the Bible says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers, principalities. Hey, let us not fight. Hey, wah, hey, wah, fight, fight. Then some even go to the point of why they say that they are shooting Satan. Po, po, po. Some say we are doing bazooka tongues against the devil. Poco, 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 patuta, 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 grugrum, pum, 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 pa, bazooka tongues. Folks, did you not read? Did you not read the St. Corinthians? The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. It's not, it's not fleshly approach by the way you speak your tongues. That shows that you are defeating Satan. Satan doesn't understand tongues. It is for the body of Christ. You cannot use, you cannot use a whip to say, I'm going to whip Satan, or I'm going to use broom to sweep away my problems. No, spirit, it doesn't even dent the spirit. You cannot use, you cannot use machete. You see, they don't understand. So when they see the word wrestle, they think it means fight. So I want to ask a question before I go on. Although wrestling is a type of fight, but it's wrestling fighting. Is that what Paul is saying? And look at the starting. For we are not wrestling. The word for means since. How do you start the sentence with since? Since or therefore could be a better word. Therefore, we are not, therefore, therefore, based from where? Verse 11, when he said, put on, put on, be conscious. So he's giving you an alert, be conscious of who you are in Christ, because somebody is going to try to come to lie to you, to let you feel that you are nobody, to put fear in you that it will not work. So be conscious. So our, this wrestling is not fighting. What is the aim of wrestling? The aim of wrestling is to destabilize. Is he talking about my physical body? No. We have seen so far, he has been dealing with facts of the gospel, knowledge of the gospel, who you are in Christ. So what is going on here? Satan is using words of situations to let you change your mind in what you believe. So he comes and says that your uncle died of cancer. You too, you are the next in line. Satan can even speak through the mind of immature believers. Do you know that? Satan can even speak through the mind of immature believers. Even though at that time, Peter was not a believer, but watch. Peter, when Jesus asked him, who do men say that I am? Some say you are Elijah. Some say you are. He said, but you, Peter. He said, you are the Christ. He said, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. Then a few time later, when Jesus said, I'm, I'm going to die, Peter said, no way. You will never go to the cross. Ha! You want to complicate matters for him. He said, get behind me, Satan. S Peter one moment spoke by the spirit of God, revelation, you are the Christ. Another moment, his speech was influenced by Satan. You are not going to the cross. What? Something that I've planned already, your words are going to block him. Get behind me, Satan, not him. He noticed that a certain spirit has influenced Satan's speech. Hey, so Satan can speak through the mind of immature believers. One moment, he said, you are the Christ. He told Peter. Peter said, another moment, you cannot die. So this word wrestling has wrongly influenced believers, even in the way we pray and view the world, world and Satan is laughing. When you do those things, go, 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 go. I'm shooting Satan. Po, pa, po, pa, po, pa. All those kind of praying, Holy Ghost, fire, fire, fire. No, please. Bible has its language. Most of the time, when the Bible uses fire in relation to the Holy Spirit, it's not talking about destruction. Ayabaya. The word fire is another word for passion. Uh oh, it's passion. 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 The word is hello. It's not fire to destroy buildings like, what, what, what is it going to do? No. Holy Ghost and fire. Holy Ghost, which is the passion. The zeal is zeal. 
Passion is translated as zeal. Zeal. You are burning with desire. When the Holy Spirit comes into a person, he gives the person desire for the things of the spirit. It consumes you. You, you say, I am consumed with this passion of playing tennis. It's not fire destruction. No, 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 no. 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 It's not fire destruction. Well, are we doing fire service? Is it fire service? No. How can it be fire service? So the word wrestle. So let's take the word wrestle. Let's take the word wrestle. I'll just deal with that. Hey, I don't know if you're ready for this. Makata Yaba. When I speak in tongues, it means that something is coming that will be of a benefit to you. That means there will be light thrown on this. Light, 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 light. Light is coming on this. Hey, Madadadaya. Rezete Yaba. For you to know that it's not English language wrestle, so you think there's some fight involved. Oh, no, 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 no. So now watch it. Kabadadaya. The word wrestle means the enforcement of an obtained victory. Yeah? Therefore, we are not using our power that we have received to use it against human beings. We are not taking the power. Therefore, we wrestle, we don't, we do, we, we enforce our the word wrestle means enforcement. <laughs> Enforcement. Okay, you, you don't get it. Let's look at let's look at sumo wrestlers. What does a sumo wrestler do? They hold each other. What am I trying to do to the other person that I'm holding? I'm trying to impose, impose my stability, my strength on him by destabilizing. Yeah. Okay. He also wants to take hold of me and destabilize, but we are all not standing at the same place. Me, the believer, I'm already superior to Satan. His Satan is lower than me, but he's trying, and he's trying, he wants to try, he wants to try to see if there's a chance. Him even doing it does not change anything. He just wants to do that for me to feel disorganized and out of place, but my spirit status is already higher than him. Let me give you another example. It is like me going to fight Mike Tyson. He's he was, let's say at that time, world champion. And then I start to make noise in the press, Mike Tyson. <laughs> I will finish him. Mike Tyson doesn't need to talk back because he is the world champion. He just sits there at the news conference and then he just laughs. <laughs> uh, okay, let's, let's do the match. 60 million. Okay, no problem. We go into the ring. I jump up and down. Mike Tyson knows this guy. Already I'm superior to him. I'll just give him one and he's gone. So even though with all, I've called my friends, I've called all pastors, I've called FGCI London, come. But my Tyson knows that. <laughs> Look at this one. Okay, no problem. They put the fence back. Bang, bang. I go, I go. My Tyson just he's just cool. He has more professionalism. He knows who he is. He has been over 100 bouts. He's the world champion. He has got tricks. I have none. I have none. But I am trying. By the first blow, the guy ducks. He just do one move. I am gone. <laughs> he comes into the ring knowing he's world champion. He comes into the ring knowing. So the word wrestle is enforcement of an obtained victory. Hey, Yabaya. Maintaining. That's the meaning. For since our enforcement, since our maintaining what has been obtained by the resurrection of Christ is not for flesh and blood. We don't use our authority, you know, and, 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 and be fighting human beings. We know better that there, there are influences behind. So I don't attack the person per se. I don't attack the manager per se. I don't waste my time and attack those people. I know better. Oh, I don't know if you're getting this. I'm not even, I'm not, I'm just scratching still. I've still not got into it yet. This is not a conflict where, now this is where people get it wrong. This is not a conflict in this, for we are not wrestling with flesh and blood. We are not wrestling. It's, it's, not, it's not an equal match. Hey. Oh, so that is why in prayer, many people think that I am praying and fighting to get a victory. No. It, this is not a conflict where the winner is now going to be determined. 
<laughs> no, no. See, 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 so this is where your knowledge. No, that's what Paul is trying to get to you. Remember chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. You are already superior. So you are enforcing. You know that, oh, hey, 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 wait, 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 wait. This thing is below me. I will not allow this influence to get out. You see, you are you're already enforcing from a place of prominence. The winner has already been determined. How do we know that? First John chapter five, verse four and five says, whosoever is born of God overcomes the world by the fact that you are born again without you even saying one prayer. You have already. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. What does it mean? The main problem that Satan had in controlling the whole world was the sin of Adam. And when you got born again, you are out of the sin of Adam. So that side has collapsed. So already you are superior to Satan because the thing that he had over you is taken out by you being born again. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Our faith in what Jesus did. Our faith in his faithfulness. And that is what he's talking about, that when you go to prayer or as a believer, if your mind is, I am now going to fight, which a lot of believers do, I'm now going to fight. Hey, that's for this problem. Hey, you have to fight. Too. Hey, Pastor Fred, you have to fight. Too. No, that means your, your, your mindset is wrong. Your mindset approach is wrong. And that's what Paul is correcting here. For we wrestle not, for we enforce not. See that we enforce, our enforcement is not fiscal opponents, but against the powers. Now I'm going to deal with that against the masters of this world. Now look at the word which I'll deal with tomorrow. Oh, look at the word. Look at the word I'll deal with tomorrow. Yeah. Watch, against the despotisms, against the powers, against the master rulers. Oh, let me get there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Master rulers. Who are the rulers of this present darkness? That is key. He is talking about here. In fact, the way Paul listed them, he listed them in order of the lowest, of sorry, of the highest to the lowest. So when he starts uh, in, 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 the, in the dominion of darkness, okay, despotisms, highest, against the powers, next, master rulers of the world. But watch at the key, look at the keyword, look at the keyword, then I close with that. I'll have to do this again tomorrow, this part, because there's still more. Okay, they are rulers of what? Look at this, look at this here. They are rulers of what? They are rulers of what? They are rulers of what? Darkness. Are you darkness? Are you darkness? Is the believer darkness? Darkness stands for Satan and unbelievers. The realm of where Satan ruled. Darkness, spiritual death. The man or the realm of people who don't know Jesus. Are you darkness? Am I darkness? No, we are light. Darkness stands also for ignorance. I'll deal more with this. Darkness also stands for lack of knowledge of who you are in Christ. So they don't even rule us. They rule, he said what? Rulers, look, the master spirits who are the world, Rulers, world, not body of Christ, world, not body of Christ, of this present darkness, darkness representing no Christ, people who have no knowledge of Christ, unbelievers. So it is not even an equal match. And I'll deal with this viciously tomorrow because I cannot rush this. There's too much in here to rush. In Jesus' name, amen. Glory to God. Amen. Thank you, Sister Hetty.